Hello everyone, Jaquel Meister here. It's been a while, but today I want to tell you about one of my great loves, cooking. One of my New Year's resolutions for 2021 of last year was to get in the kitchen more. Before that, aside from frying eggs, you wouldn't see me in here making much of anything. I didn't have any knife skills and I didn't know many dishes even. But now I love cooking more than playing music, more than playing video games even. I do it almost every day. I have two cooking inspirations, two people who helped me get good, and neither of them are real. One is Remy from Ratatouille, and the other is Chowder from, from Chowder. I'll bring them both up later in the video. I'm not a professional, I'm just a home cook, and not everything I make comes out fantastic. I would say one out of every eight or nine is a miss, but other than that, I'm pretty good. So these are my seven tips to actually help you get started cooking. And just to get the basic one out of the way, rule zero, have fun. I always play fun music when I cook, Cue the music, let's get started. Number one, learn to wash dishes fast and aggressively. The main roadblock I see for people who don't wanna cook but have an interest in it is they don't wanna clean up the mess. And to be blunt, if you wanna cook a lot, you will be washing dishes all the time. It's just part of my everyday life now to wash dishes multiple times throughout the day. But don't be discouraged. I have a cheat for you. Wash the dishes as fast as you can, and I would almost say with aggression. Don't damage the dishes, of course, but you have no idea how much time you'll save if you do this. So how did I get this attitude? I worked as a delivery driver for Domino's Pizza last year, and I'd say half of that job was being a busboy. I would take out two to three bags full of pizzas and sides every trip out of the store from 5 to 7 p.m. during rush only to come back to a literal pile of dishes in the sink in the back. I would stay past midnight most nights I had the closing shift, just scrubbing in the back. Especially the pans used to make those delicious pan pizzas. You couldn't do much with those pans because they had a layer of grease in the bottom. Aside from blast it with the hottest water you can and use super concentrated soap, just turning the back of Domino's into the sauna because of all the steam that was rising. I learned if I want to get home sooner, I shouldn't do this lackadaisically. I should do it hard and fast. So when I look at my dishes back home, it suddenly became easy mode. They're always a breeze to me now. And yes, it does require an initial burst of energy, but just realize how much time and energy you'll save if you approach dishes this way. Also, you could use a dishwasher, but I was never used to use that kind of sorcery. So, whatever. Point two, use your nose. Remember that scene when Remy runs around the lid of the pot making French lentil soup? He's rushing around sniffing for what ingredients will help. I employ a similar process when I cook. Us big-nosed boys were born to cook. See, scent and taste are inherently connected. They are neurologically related. When I was a kid in school, in science class, we did this experiment where you close your eyes and you pinch your nose and you try different kinds of Skittles and see if you can guess what flavor it is. But the point is, if you can't smell, you can't distinguish flavors because they're inherently connected. See, I don't measure much when I cook. I usually just sniff the pot, sniff whatever I want to add, and then boom, it's in. Your nose is an excellent guide for quality and adjustment when it comes to cooking. You can smell when something's off or when something's missing from like your super sauce. And you can smell when something is dang good. But of course, this will need to be developed with trial and error. In a broader sense, I'm saying that to follow your nose's intuition, you also need to develop taste. And this is important not just for the culinary arts, but really any art. It's the reason why all good writers are good readers. They take in a lot thoughtfully and develop a taste for what's good and what isn't. To talk about my other inspiration, the reason I got good at cooking is the same reason Chowder did. It's that we both love to eat. I've always loved yummy food and I seek it out. Your hunger and enjoyment as a consumer should be your guide to making tasty food in the kitchen. Point number three, adjust saltiness, sweetness, and spiciness. Most dishes can be fixed or made more complicated and interesting by adjusting these three flavors. In our Western palate, we mainly play around with those three. Other cultures are quicker to use the flavors of sourness and bitterness. And for some people, they only use uh, saltiness and sweetness because they can't tolerate much spice. Which is a dang shame because spice can actually cover up a lot. Like if you've ever had a grocery store rotisserie chicken and you got to that bland breast of a ton of dry meat in the middle, it's usually so lame but you hit it with Tabasco or your favorite hot sauce and suddenly it's, it's great, it's excellent. You can also adjust food of course by adjusting umami like adding more stock or demi-gloss if you're super fancy or cumin for that earthy flavor but that's kind of less obvious. I, I would focus on mainly those three. So for now, let's focus on these three. Saltiness, sweetness, 
and spiciness. Recipes will have ingredients that already contribute these flavors. So adjusting the ratios of those ingredients will adjust the ratios of those flavors. Oh my gosh, am I, am I being redundant? Here are some generic examples of how to adjust. Uh, salty, uh, use salt, duh. But you can also use, uh, if you're doing like a stir fry, you can use soy sauce. And in a lot of recipes you can use Wor Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire Worcestershire Welsh sauce. That wasn't that funny, was it? I don't know. Sweet, whatever fruit or bell pepper is in the dish. Um, but my personal favorite ingredient to use right now is actually tomato paste. I get it in this, in this like toothpaste tube from Cento and you cook it in and it can help almost anything. Things you wouldn't even think it would benefit from. Also, the amount of tomato paste you can add to dishes can be so variable. You can add a bit or a ton, and it won't really change the dish a ton, but it's just, it's a great ingredient to add to, to many things. Spicy, the amount of peppers in the dish, or of course you can add your favorite hot sauce, like Tabasco, or, I don't know, Texas Pete, if you're degenerate. <laughs> Hold up, I'm getting it. But my personal favorite way to adjust for spiciness is to add some cayenne pepper. You can just shake some cayenne pepper in and it'll really, it'll waken up a lot of boring food. You'll get a feel for what to adjust as you smell and taste the food as it cooks, which you should be doing. But um, you'll get a sense for if a flavor is lacking or missing. For example, if your food tastes dull, that generally means it's lacking in salt, especially in something like soup, unsalted soup, that just tastes like depression. Point number four, make what you like. This one should be obvious, but especially starting out, it's important to do this. Cooking in general is pretty involved, and so you'll want some enthusiasm to push you forward. It'll make you sharper and energize you to be in the kitchen more, which is really what's important here. And a lot of different dishes can teach you the fundamentals like knife work, sauteing, heat control, that sort of thing. So what's important is that you really make something that you want to make because it'll energize you to be in the kitchen more and learn. For me, it was chicken parmesan. That's my favorite food of all time. I used to look forward to Sunday all week because after church, my family would go to this Italian restaurant and I would finally get that sandwich that I longed for. Uh, just a personal story to show you my devotion to this sandwich. One day, I skipped breakfast and as lunch was rolling around, I decided it's chicken parm time. Place the order. Ready for pickup in 15 minutes? I'll be there in 10. Get the sandwich, set her in the passenger seat, and I drive home. The smell is tantalizing. I'm imagining the crispy fried chicken and the sweet tomato sauce, a perfect balance of flavors, perfectly complemented with a side of homemade chips. I'm like Romeo, eloping with Juliet on horseback under the dark of night. I want to hasten and speed to our place of sanctuary, so I step on the pet a little more. But then, I pass one parking lot in which the constable, the sheriff, was lurking. After I pass him, he turns onto the road, and I look into my rearview mirror, and I'm thinking, surely he's not trying to pull me over, right? Well, he did. I got a ticket, and then I went home. <laughs> now, that's a, a bit of exaggerating, but, but it's true. I got pulled over for speeding because I was trying to get home to eat my chicken parm sandwich. <laughs> I was like, huh, why are all these people breaking all of a sudden? But by the time I saw him, it was, it was too late. Honestly, though, that was probably the best sandwich I've ever had from that restaurant. And it might have been because of the thrill, for all I know. Anyway, that's how much I love chicken parm. And the fact that I can make my favorite food at home for cheaper and sometimes better than what I get in restaurants, that's just like magic to me. This is one of those profound revelations only entrusted to those of us with the spirit to pick up a knife and pan and get our hands dirty in the kitchen. That that craving, that ideal stir fry or pasta or healthy falafel bowl that you search and comb through restaurants for hoping to find that grail that meets your tastes and standards. That search can end in your own house. The best restaurant you've ever been to can be your own house. You can make that warm, comforting soup you want on a winter day or an Italian dinner better than most restaurants for cheaper. And that brings me to my next point. Point number five, evaluate cost. It's usually cheap. One thing that intimidated me from getting into cooking is the thought of being wasteful. I didn't like the thought of spending time at the grocery store, paying for ingredients, and then the meal not ending up that good. If you have that problem, it's a good idea to reframe your mindset. You'll probably end up paying like 10 to $15 for a good meal at a restaurant on the cheaper end. But if you're buying ingredients to cook that same meal at home, you could be spending like two times as much up front. 
But think about it. Quantity wise, you could be making that meal for a whole family, or it could be tonight's dinner and then tomorrow's lunch. You're paying for multiple meals rather than just that one. Generally speaking, it's far more affordable to cook regularly than eat out, especially when the food you're making is basic stuff like pasta or beans or rice. It costs like nothing to make pasta or rice. Oftentimes I'll contemplate going out to restaurants now and I'll think, What's even the point? I can make this for cheaper and better at home. The advantage of eating out, of course, is atmosphere slash service and time. You're saving time. You're mainly paying for someone's time and labor rather than the food itself. And that evaluation of time versus cost is just something you have to decide for yourself and think about how much time you actually have to prepare food. But lots of things you can cook really quickly. And lots of things you can cook in bulk, like you make a big pot of stew or something. When evening spent, making a pot of stew tonight means you don't have to cook tomorrow or maybe even the day after that. When you shop, I recommend looking at the smaller per ounce price. You can see really just how affordable things get when you buy in bulk. But don't go overboard, for real. Don't buy more than you can eat. Look at the expiration date and think, can you really cook and eat all of this in that time? And this is especially important for someone like me who mainly just cooks for myself at my apartment. With produce, honestly, I just try to get it the day of because not much is sadder than old produce. Doing this cost evaluation gives you room to fail because you know you're being efficient with your money. If you're like me, you're cautious. You don't like wasting anything. At the end of an RPG, you end up with a full inventory of potions because you were afraid to use any of them. But think of this as finding that one guy that'll sell you a dozen Moo Moo Milks in Pokemon Gold and Silver, I think. Sure, you spend more for the dozen up front than you do getting items from the vending machine, but overall, it's a way better deal. Just a Pokemon reference for you nerds out there. Point number six, beans are the answer to everything. Speaking of cost, beans. Super healthy, extremely cheap, effortless. I buy them canned, they're already cooked. I just rinse them in the colander and then I literally throw them in whatever I need them for. They make anything more filling, they can add more texture. When you're trying to cut on carbs, just swap out rice or whatever grain you're eating for beans. They're high in protein as well as many other nutrients. I honestly think they'll be the next health craze slash fad. I read some research recently that showed that eating beans not only every day, but in every single meal is correlated with a decrease in cardiovascular disease and cancer occurrence. The only thing you gotta watch for, and you know this, is gas. So just know your body and eat what you can. There's so many kinds of beans, but they're all pretty and they can add visual contrast. For example, in beans and rice. But my personal favorites are black, cannellini, chickpeas, and fava. Some things you can make with it. Huevos rancheros, fool, crunchy oven chickpeas, chili, beans and rice, hummus, falafel. Oh my goodness, so many things. I bought some cans in bulk because my store was selling them at 30 cents a can. I have an entire shelf full of beans now and they stay good for so long. If you wanna start cooking, you can already start stacking up towers of them for the same price of one pack of meat. And I should say, uh, <clears throat> beans. Take number six. Beans. <laughs> Messes up your throat. Number seven, watch videos and look up recipes online. The internet changed cooking forever. Now you don't need any interpretation for a recipe, really. You can see exactly what they're doing. You can even see what the food is supposed to look like at different stages to see if you're doing a good job so far. For the record, my favorite cooking YouTubers right now are Chef John from Food Wishes, Adam Ragusia, Sip and Feast, Not Another Cooking Show, and Nastasia Can Cook. Following a recipe has never been easier. There's no guesswork or trying to understand what they mean. They also got a link to the website for the exact recipe with ingredient amounts and whatnot. This honestly reminds me of lab classes I took as an undergraduate STEM student. Um, I went for biology and I recently graduated. General chemistry lab. It's a nightmare. One source of frustration is going into lab every week and beforehand, you would have to read pages of the driest stuff you've ever read in your life, the lab manual. And it's dense instructions you often have to read and reread. I often had to draw a diagram of what I was doing. I've never had to do that with cooking. And when you finally do the lab, it's actually not that complicated. And I remember me and my peers wishing we had a video showing us the procedure. And for the few times that we actually got a video, it was supremely helpful. It helped our comprehension and our performance. It was crazy good. See, with cooking today, that frustration doesn't exist. The videos basically hold your hand throughout the whole cooking process. I want that to be the standard. I want there to be the same amount of lab and cooking instructional videos. 
but one's way more fun than the other. Also, you can't eat what you make in the lab, although some of us will try. To end this tangent, the lab really is like the kitchen, heating up pots and beakers, constantly washing dishes, making sure to avoid cross-contamination. Every good chemist I've met has been a good cook, without exception. I mean, Walter White, what he does is called cooking. And when I got good at cooking, the task rotation in it, it translated to helping me in lab. The last thing I want to mention about the internet and cooking is that accessibility to international foods has never been better. The internet connects people, their ideas, and also their cuisine. And it's honestly such a beautiful thing. I really feel more connected as a global citizen when I watch people share their most cherished and comforting foods growing up. I think it's beautiful that so many people all over the world love food and are willing to share theirs with others. Many of my favorite recipes right now are foreign. Fool, Nigerian beef stew, chicken paprikash, shakshuka. I'm a stew man, in case you can't tell. In my opinion, it's a way you can participate as a better citizen of the modern world. That was a long video. I honestly hope this was helpful. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm so passionate about this subject. I realize some of my tips may come across as common sense, but sometimes you need a reminder and those things can push you to help you cook more. Please let me know if you found this exciting. I could do more serious educational videos in the future, but honestly, I think my future cooking content would be like wacky stuff. Like cooking with sands. I don't know. Tell me what you think. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Also, just so you guys know, I had the most razo moment in my script. I had this part where I said, <clears throat> most recipes have constitutory elements that contribute flavors. And I thought, constitutory elements? Why not just say ingredients? <laughs> what a dense way of saying that. Okay, cut, we're done. The internet connects people, their ideas, and also their cuisine. Discord, shut up! Damn.